Hi, welcome to the second session of Pirates, Smugglers, and the Making of the Modern World. Now, last week, I went over a basic outline of the course, sort of from A to Z, what we're going to be covering, the topics, and how they fit together, some of the analytical points that are going to come up along the way. And then at the end, we went over some of the mechanics of the course. But Hi, along Ron. the... Yes? Um, I'm ho here at the Sugarland campus. Oh, yeah. And we, we don't have any syllabus or, or anything. Okay. We'll arrange to get some sent out to you. And if you don't have a syllabus, however, we, the way you can get it the fastest is go to the distance education website. That's right off of the University of Houston homepage. And on distance education, you will see a listing for syllabi. And the syllabi is on there. And you can just download it from there. If that, is that going to be possible for you? Yes, sir, should be. OK, if it's a problem, okay, if it's a problem email me. My email is tobrian at uh.edu. And I'll shoot you one out, OK, if you, if you have any problem in downloading it. OK, do we have any assignments? Because I haven't gotten anything. Yeah, there's some reading assignments, but I don't want to cite them on the tape just because it gets confusing when I change it. Sure. Uh, but okay. you're really not behind at this point because we're just you know, into the second session. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. If you get any other questions, feel free to email me. Okay. So, anyways, when I was covering that sort of long section on what's the course going to be about, I must have said the words pirates and smugglers about 200 times at least. Today, I'm hardly going to mention pirates and smugglers, which seems rather odd for a course about pirates and smugglers, except at the beginning and the end, because this is one of two background sessions that we're going to do. Before we go into piracy in the early modern world, starting next week with the Barbarossas, etc., we need to set the background in terms of what was going on in the world at that time, what are the kinds of factors that gave rise to piracy specifically in these periods we're going to be looking at. Later, when we get into the modern era, specifically the 20th century, again, I'll stop and we'll take a session just to look at how was the world changing again in terms of globalization, etc., and how did these forces contribute to the rise of piracy. So for much of today, what we're going to be looking at is background, the rise of these trading empires that I said were so important in the creation of piracy and the flourishing of piracy in the early modern world. Who were these people? What were they after? What kinds of conflicts did they have? And then we will see, starting next week, you'll see exactly how the pirates fit into all of this. How do they become a force in this process of the creation of these great empires at the beginning of the early modern era? Now, one thing I stressed last week was that piracy and smuggling have existed down through virtually the whole history of civilized humanity. And when I say civilized humanity, uh, and we'll see this term has different connotations, what we really mean is when societies start to organize in elaborate forms. In other words, you have some type of political system, you have a military of some sort, uh, religious institutions, when societies become that elaborate, well, that's what we call civilization, okay, when they take on those characteristics. Now it has a, a different connotation that's sort of value-laden that we'll get into in a minute as well, but basically we're talking about when societies become reasonably elaborate with state systems, religious institutions, etc. So pretty much down through ancient history to the present, we have cases of piracy and smuggling. However, we're not going to talk about the ancient world to any great extent because piracy was not very significant during most of that period. It's not that it didn't exist, it's just that it's not highly significant, and I'll explain why in a moment. There is one interesting case of piracy from the ancient world that's worth mentioning, um, largely because it reflects something about the temperament of the times. Uh, in the Mediterranean world, and that is the world dominated by Rome back in ancient times. And particularly near the end of the Roman Republic, in the years leading up to the beginning of the what's either called the Christian era or contemporary era, in that period of history when Rome dominated the Mediterranean, there were problems with pirates, particularly in the eastern Mediterranean. Now, on one occasion, a young Roman citizen was sailing with a group of compatriots uh, visiting the eastern Mediterranean when his ship was waylaid by a group of pirates. They took 
uh, the crew and the passengers hostage and took them to their base. Mm -hmm. At that point, the pirates sat around trying to decide what they were going to do with the people they had captured. And a common practice, as we will see, very common among pirates in later periods as well, is of course to ransom uh, the captives that you've taken. It's a good source of income. But of course, you have to be sure that the people that you're trying to demand a ransom for are worth it. In other words, can they pay the freight? Do they have family, friends, are they high enough up in government or whatever that somebody's willing to pay a lot of money to get them out of their hostage situation? So the pirates first went around asking names of individuals to find out who they were. And one young Roman citizen refused to answer. And finally, one of his compatriots, not wanting to anger the pirates any more than necessary, said, well, that's Julius Caesar. Uh, he said, Ooh. Pirates looked at each other like, huh? And the compatriot tried to explain, you know, he's a kind of a big deal and, you know, he's young, but he's rising rapidly in the ranks of Roman politicians. Uh, so the pirates then decided to sit down and figure out, well, how much should they demand for each of the captives? And they were sitting around, they came up with a number for Caesar, and Caesar looked over and laughed at them and said, you gotta be kidding. He said, you don't realize who I am and how important I really am. You should be asking for three times what you're thinking of asking for as a ransom. The pirates said, well, you must know your own worth, so okay, triple the ransom. And then they sent one of their people off to meet with the local Roman governor and explain that, you know, we got all these people, including some young wise guy named Caesar, uh, Judas, who insists that he's worth triple what we think he's worth. But in any case, they would go off, and this was a fairly accepted practice that the pirates would take captives at times, and of course, if they were significant Roman citizens, they would be ransomed by the local governor. In the meantime, Judas is getting to know the pirates. Uh, he gambles with them. That was a common pastime and activity. They play a few sporting games, etc., and they sit around and share stories, that sort of thing. Um, and, well, Julius starts to get along with the pirates fairly well. He also tells them, quite frankly, that once he's ransomed, he's going to come back and see that they're all arrested and executed. And, of course, they laugh at him because that wasn't the way the game worked. I mean, the idea was, look, we capture people, we don't kill them, we ransom them, Roman governor pays the ransom, okay, everybody goes back square one, we start the game all over. Uh, eventually, the ransom shows up, and Julius and his friends get sent back to the local provincial capital. Uh, Julius runs to go see the governor and says, well, okay, now you have to get a military expedition together and go after these you know, evil pirates and capture them, etc. Governor says, well, look, I've got a lot of business on my plate right now. Uh, I'll think about it, and I'll let you know. Uh, about a day later, the governor got called off out of the provincial capital. Julius, being a persistent sort of fellow, went to see the local military commander and browbeat him into allowing him to use a group of Roman soldiers to go after the pirates. So he goes, captures the pirates, and by God, brought them back, and they were taken to the provincial capital, and they were all crucified. Yeah. And Julius went out to watch them as they're yeah, hanging on a crucifix, which is a very painful way to die. and kills you essentially by asphyxiation. Um, I'm not sure what the moral of this story is, other than the fact that proves Julius Caesar didn't have much of a sense of humor. Um, but it does demonstrate that piracy did exist in earlier ages, and some of the rules of the game had already been established, that as long as the pirates weren't creating inordinate disruptions in sea traffic, etc., that they would be tolerated by the Roman governors. Uh, this is one of the things when we talked about the impact of the state, that sometimes piracy can exist because it just isn't worth it to whatever the local state system is to go after the pirates and use military resources to actually eliminate them, uh, except when you have somebody annoying like Judas Caesar on your back. Uh, the other reality is that piracy just wasn't that common most of the time, only occasionally. Uh, did the Roman government decide to muster a significant force and go out and deal with pirates, particularly in the eastern Mediterranean where they had a number of problems. The reasons why, other than this occasional exception, like Caesar, uh, why piracy was not a very large business at the time, nor was smuggling for that matter, has to do with the realities of the world in this era. Let me just look at this map for a moment, which is nice and blank. So. There's nothing on it, except what I'll tell you is on it. If you look at the world, let's say this is the world in, you know, uh, 50 AD or something, you'd find an imperial system here in China, 
uh, you'd find a series of fragment. well, you'd find the Roman Empire here, uh, you'd find the beginnings of imperial systems here, you'd also see a couple of systems here in uh, Central and uh, Mesoamerica, as it's known, and then here in South America, you'd find one developing as well. But generally speaking, these systems, although they are connected to each other through trade, there are trade routes running across northern Africa and all the way into Asia, and there is trade between North and South America in these early periods. The fact is, this trade, to a large extent, was very limited. Few precious goods. The most famous routes were the, what were known as the Silk Roads, which ran from China across northern India, what's Afghanistan today and Pakistan, through the Middle East, and then to the Mediterranean. So there was actually trade between the Roman Empire in areas as far, far away as China. But it was very limited. I mean, this is a few precious goods. Uh, it's very difficult to transport goods over land. It's rather dangerous much of the time because so much of this land is not under the control of any particular centralized government. And as far as travel by sea, uh, travel by sea was a problem because it's dangerous. First of all, in terms of the forms of ship construction and navigational knowledge, people generally don't sail over long distances over the ocean. Uh, let's go to this map for a minute, although it's not in the period we're talking about. We're going to come back and later and look at it. If you just look at the Mediterranean, which is, you would think, a relatively safe place. I mean, this isn't the Atlantic, it isn't the Pacific, it's mostly enclosed, except here and here, by land. Uh, people did not, if they could help it in the time of Julius Caesar, let's say, take long voyages across the Mediterranean. If you wanted to get from here to there, you'd sort of edge along the coast if you could, and then of course if you had to scamper across a short area of water, you'd do that because, again, finding out exactly where you are on the water at this time is not very easy. Yes, you can figure out, oh well, gee, you know, there are the heavens, like I figure out what the North Star is, and I know the sun rises and eats and sets in the west, well that's fine. You know, I know I'm headed east or west generally or north or south generally, but exactly where I'm going, it's a little difficult to tell. So ships tended to stay close to shore. And in the winter, there was hardly any transport of goods at all because it was considered too dangerous. You know, high seas, storms could easily destroy your ships, even though, again, the Mediterranean, by comparison, would not be considered as nearly as difficult a body of water to cross as a major ocean like the Atlantic or the Pacific. So part of the reason is just the level of trade internationally that's going on. Secondly, the fact that it's very limited in particular across the waters. And another reason why particularly smuggling is not widespread is that given the limited amount of trade that's actually taking place, even in some places like the Roman Empire in terms of long distance trade, uh, tariffs, taxes on goods are not very high. Most of the time, if you're shipping goods uh, inside the Roman Empire, it costs you like a 1% tariff when you land your goods and have to pay a tariff and import duty. It's about 1%, maybe 2%. That's really nickel and dime. That doesn't justify smuggling. I mean, you're not going to make a big profit smuggling to get past a 1% or 2% duty. The one rare exception to this was with goods coming in off the Silk Roads from the east, from Asia. There, there were high tariffs, about 25%, but that's because the Romans, just like modern governments, had drain problems in terms of money. In other words, balance of payments. There was gold and silver and other precious goods flowing out of the empire to buy the goods that were coming in from Asia. To try to limit that, they put a fairly high import duty. But that was the exception. Most of the time, they weren't very high. So the targets of opportunity are pretty limited. You know, international trade is not at nearly the levels we will see, let's say, by 1500. It's very difficult to transport goods across the water at this time through any great distance. So your target's kind of limited. It's kind of hard to be a pirate if you don't have a ship to attack. And then as far as smuggling goes, the import and export duties are very, very limited. So why bother smuggling? You know, it's not that it didn't occur. Just as we've seen, piracy obviously existed in the ancient world. But generally speaking, it's quite limited for those reasons. Now we want to look at, okay, well, what changed? Why is it that by 1500, 1600 AD, we're talking about a world in which piracy flourishes? So what are the factors that 
take us from these conditions in the ancient world, which minimized the significance of piracy, to an era when it suddenly exploded in terms of its importance, not only piracy, but smuggling. And here we have to look at the rise of the early modern world. And I've set the sort of time span of 1200 to 1700 AD. So almost everything we're going to talk about today is happening in this time period. This is when things are shaking up the world, and the world is changing in a significant way. And what's going to happen is those you know, distant empires, those small, relatively isolated states that I was talking about and showing or pointing to on the map a moment ago, that's going to change. Large empires that are intimately connected with international trade and with each other are going to emerge in the period after 1200. Now, the question is, why does that happen? There are a variety of explanations, and I'm really going to focus on one for the moment, just because you know, this isn't a course about the rise of trading empires. But one important factor that we know about is changes in climate that occur in the period leading up to about 1200 in the contemporary era. Now, we talk about global warming today you know, and how human activity, industrialization, has been affecting the world's climate. But of course, as we know, as much as human activity is affecting it now, over the millennia, over thousands of years, over the course of you know, the record of natural history, it's clear that the Earth's climate has changed periodically, that there is a certain cycle of cooling and warming cycles that have occurred in history even before human beings could impact their own empire, uh, I mean their own environment in a significant way. And here uh, I'm pointing out a cooling cycle that occurs between 300 and 800 contemporary era, and then a warming cycle between 800 and 1200. In other words, for about the four centuries leading up to this sort of key period from 1200 on. So why do we care? Well, okay, so some glaciers were melting or freezing, so what? Well, the big factor about this, and particularly the warming cycles, is that with warming cycles, populations tend to expand. They tend to expand because with the warming of the Earth's surface, this allows, particularly in temperate climates, more than one agricultural cycle in a year. In other words, you can get in more than one planting and harvest. Two, so you can produce more food. More food means more people are likely to survive, means the population is going to expand. Even if you're not cultivating food, if you're involved in grazing, the weather stays warmer, the goats get to feed more, the sheep get to feed more, the ox get to feed more, they reproduce more, you get more animals, you get more people, more things to eat. So warming cycles tend to cause the population to expand because they make it possible, essentially, to increase food levels, and that tends to increase survival rates for people, and mortality rates are pretty high at this time, and one of the factors is access to adequate food. Lots of people die in the winter because they don't have enough food. Now you get longer summers, shorter winters, more people survive. The importance of this is that as these populations grow, we're going to see conflicts develop between two basic groups, between sedentary and nomadic people. The world at this time, go back to my blank map, is divided essentially between two types of societies, agrarian and nomadic. If we look across this part of the world in particular, you would see across this stretch of Eurasia, large areas of plains, okay, the tundra, etc., the northern hmm, tundra, grassy uh, plains, the steppes of Russia, etc. And here, nomadic people have populated this region, parts of northern Africa. And we would see here in what's now the American Southwest, similar kinds of conditions. These nomadic people tend to rely on hunting, on the grazing of animals. Okay? That's one of their principal means of sustenance, and they tend to move around with their animals okay, to new feeding areas, or they're following animals that they're hunting. So they are nomadic populations, as opposed to the groups that have been developing since about 5000 BC, since the development of horticulture, which means the cultivation of plants. Since people started putting seeds in the ground and realizing, you know, if I plant seed in the ground, put water on it, it'll grow, I can eat the stuff that comes out of the ground. And they, from that time forward, began forming sedentary 
populations based on horticulture, which means cultivation of crops, later agriculture when they bring in animals to assist them. In any case, these agricultural societies form the sedentary populations. So we have two different types. Here across this region, through, let's say, the American Southwest, here in Northern Africa, and there are other, we're just doing them, rough divisions here. And then in places like Europe, in much of Central Africa, in the uh, sub Indian subcontinent, here through much of what is China, et cetera, Indian regions, and so on, we get the sedentary populations. Now, normally, or I shouldn't say normally, in general, relations between sedentary and nomadic groups vary. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. They often have things to swap with each other. You got a hoss, okay, you're a nomad. I got a bushel of grain. We swap, okay. I need a hoss, you need some grain. There are lots of things that they each produced that they could trade with each other, exchange with each other. So sometimes it was a fairly good relationship. The trade routes in Northern Africa would come to be protected by nomadic people, even though the people engaged in the trade are actually sedentary groups. So relationships could be good, but relationships could be bad as well. If the sedentary populations are impinging upon the nomadic groups, they don't become happy. Nomadic groups impinging upon the agrarian groups on their land. You know, we don't want you planting crops, we want to use this for grazing area. So they could be troubled at times. And indeed, sedentary people in general tended to look upon nomads as uncivilized. You know, that term civilization that I used earlier, I said it was used at times in a value-laden way. Well, people in general, and this goes from ancient history down to the present, um, people in the cities tend to look down upon people in the countryside. You know, you're a redneck, you know, you're a goober, you, know, you live out in the sticks. All right? We are sophisticated, civilized people living, we're all living in the city, of course. So this view of people who are nomadic, who are termed generally, and the term varies in English, they're called barbarians. But in general, they're seen as uncivilized, as not meeting the standards of those who don't even necessarily live in cities, but who live a sedentary life, who live in a village. So there is this cultural antagonism between the two sides. And now, these antagonisms are going to be accelerated because both groups are expanding. Populations are growing. So now there is all the more reason why these groups are going to clash with each other. Uh, wherever their borders exist between each other, they're going to be infringing upon each other's territory because both groups are looking to move outward to expand as their populations expand. So what happens by about 1200 AD is we're starting to trigger a series of conflicts. And what will occur across Eurasia, even in the Western Hemisphere, are invasions of sedentary regions by nomadic groups. And this forms an important part of the creation of the new empires that's coming about. Some of the nomadic invasions that typify this period, the Vikings, you know, you've heard about the Vikings raiding parts of Europe like England, etc. They are, in fact, a nomadic group. The rise of Islam. The spread of Islam is due in part, though this is only part of it, to the fact that it flourished among groups in the Saudi Peninsula and elsewhere that were nomadic and that used their skills at mobile warfare to spread not only their political control but their religion through much of North Africa and eastward towards India. So these nomadic groups play an important role in helping bring about the creation of large empires. And so too Turkish people, people from Turk linguistic groups and the Mongols, the Mongols being located in Asia in the regions north of the Chinese Empire. All of these groups were on the move in this period from 1200 on, invading these sedentary groups. And out of this invasionary process often comes a mingling, comes the creation of, on the one hand, stable imperial systems, but at the same time imperial systems governed by what were nomadic groups and warrior groups uh, who were skilled in mobile warfare, as I suggested, from their experiences. This is a major contributing factor to the rise of the kinds of empires that we're going to be looking at. Now, what are specific examples of how this process takes place? What are the new empires? 
few examples. The Mongols, these North Asian nomadic peoples who invade China and by 1279 have conquered what was called the Sung Empire, that's S-O-N-G. Uh, they had conquered the Sung Empire and imposed their own control upon China, established their own empire in what was China. You know, when Marco Polo supposedly visits China and meets the Emperor Kublai Khan, Kublai Khan is in fact a Mongol. Okay? He's not Chinese. He's one of the series of Mongol emperors who ruled China over the course of a century. Just an example. The Mamluks, Turkish-speaking people who invade the Middle East and establish an empire centered in what is modern-day Egypt. Also in Europe, after a series of nomadic invasions, the Roman Empire falls now the 8th century, then we, and as part of that, you're aware of the barbarians who invaded Europe, people who were nomadic peoples who were being pushed into Europe by other nomadic peoples. You get the breakdown of the old Roman Empire, and eventually, out of its breakdown, emerge a series of warrior states, Portugal, Spain, and others that followed. And the time that we're talking about, by like 1200 AD, that's what these places are. They're really warrior states. Okay, they are this type of fusion of nomadic peoples with strong military skills with the local sedentary populations that help create these kind of states. Whether we're looking at China, Spain, Portugal, uh, the empires that are emerging in the Middle East at this time, all of these have similar kinds of roots. So, why do we care? Well, because these new imperial systems that start to emerge are going to come into conflict with each other. One of the ones, and the first one we're going to look at next week when we look at the Barbarossas, has to do with the Mediterranean. And the emergence of two of these imperial powers who then contest with each other for control of the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the Mediterranean as of, say, 1300 AD, is largely dominated by two city-states in Italy. And in this map, I don't know if you, you probably can't see the spelling, but here is Venice. Oh, good. There. Focusing in on that. There we go. Okay, Venice, and over here you can see Genoa more easily. These are two city-states, two cities that operate as separate state systems who are heavily involved in the trade that goes on in the Mediterranean. And just as in the ancient world, trade goods are coming from all the way across from Asia, from Africa, and entering the trade patterns of the Mediterranean. And what is the Mediterranean? And it's the sort of inland sea, if you will. It is a major source of transportation, communication, and commerce. So initially, at least, at this time, at the beginning of the era we're talking about, here we have these two city-states that are two dominant influences in the region. But as we're going to see in a moment, there are two major empires that are starting to grow in the east, the Ottoman Empire, which you can clearly see here, and then Spain, over here. And both of them, of course, are going to focus in terms of trying to generate additional wealth upon the Mediterranean and controlling the growing commerce in this region. Now, this points up a second important aspect of these empires, these new empires. On the one hand, we understand that they are the product of the merging of these nomadic groups with sedentary groups, these warrior states that emerge. But also, these new empires are going to take a different approach than ancient empires like the Roman Empire. These people are more concerned with trade and commerce than ever before. They are still dependent primarily on agriculture on the, what the land produces, on what peasants produce. That's the main source of their income. But more than ever before, they are going to be looking towards commerce and gaining access to and controlling long-distance commerce as a way of expanding their wealth. And there is a sort of mutually reinforcing set of factors that are taking place here. On the one hand, improvements in navigation, improvements in sailing vessels, are making it possible to navigate and move goods more easily over the water. So 
international commerce can expand. At the same time, there are also developments on the military side, military technology, in terms of metal weapons, in terms of the development of firearms, particularly cannon, that make it possible for a state to exert far more military power than they ever had in the past, if you can get your hands on and afford to pay for the new technologies. So on the one hand, you can increase your wealth substantially if you can tap into international commerce and control it to some extent. In turn, that additional wealth will help you further add to your store of military technologies, which you then can use to further expand your military might and further expand your control over commerce. So these factors together, improved shipping technologies and improved military technologies, make it a practical state policy to say, OK, we're going to develop a powerful military, powerful navy, and we're going to use it to control commerce in a region and use that commercial wealth to further expand our military might. And it then becomes sort of, if you want, a vicious circle using one to expand the other. Military might gives you more control over commerce. Commerce gives you the wealth to expand your military might. That's what these empires are going to do as never before. Now again, they're still agrarian empires, but they're starting to focus on commercial wealth as a way of expanding. And here, these two sitting on either end of the Mediterranean, Spain and the Ottoman Empire, are two that are about to pursue this policy and come into a head-on conflict with each other over their control of the Mediterranean. Now, what other factors are going to play a role here in this process that we'll see? Well, first of all, religion is also a contributing factor to this expansionary process. The Ottomans are Islamic, and they believe it is their responsibility to help extend Islam. And of course, that can be done by extending their military and political control. The Spaniards are Catholics and believe that they have a mission you know, to extend the influence of Christianity. So on both sides, there is going to be religious motivation. You know, we're not just doing it for the money. We're doing it to spread the influence of our religion. We have a, an obligation as Muslims, as Christians, to expand the influence of our religion. So both groups are going to have a strong ideological motivation, and that is the expansion of their particular religions. Now, another factor that will contribute to this is unstable weather. We saw a few minutes ago how changes in climate led to increases in population, led to conflicts between nomadic and sedentary people. Now, we've seen the warrior states growing and expanding as a result of that process. But these states face their own problem with changing climate. An example for the European states. The warmer climate leading up to 1200, almost 1300 AD, meant that you could grow more crops. So population had been expanding. You know, if we take the warming period back from 800 AD through 1200 AD, populations are growing. Okay? But after 1200, weather starts to cool off again, meaning growing seasons are getting shorter again, meaning you're going to have a problem feeding all those people that expanded your population over the last four centuries because now maybe there's only one growing season again. So now you can't grow as much food. So food shortages are going to start to rack Europe. People are going to start suffering in severe ways from starvation. And of course, there's nothing that destabilizes a government faster in this period than food shortages. People can't eat. They're going to blame, they're not going to say, gee, that climate is really killing us, you know? El Nino is murder this year. They're going to say, we're starving because the government isn't doing something right. Whatever it is, they're not doing something right, and they are going to destabilize the regime. Governments didn't see themselves as having very many obligations to their populations. 
But one thing that you had to do is at least try to prevent starvation. One of the things why, one of the reasons why China uh, would have a series of relatively stable regimes over several thousand years is that those regimes made it a major point to try to maintain food stores to see regions through periods of famine when drought struck, etc., causing food shortages. Other states did far less, including the states in Europe. So climate change, again, is starting to destabilize these regions, raising once again the problems of can we produce enough food for our populations. And of course, one of the solutions inevitably when you've got problems at home is, well, we'll go, we'll go take somebody else's stuff. Okay? We don't have enough stuff of our own. We'll go take the other guy's stuff. Basic idea about state systems and how they work internationally, uh, still true today. Uh, you got pressures at home. The economy's not working so well. OK, look elsewhere. So this pressure will tend to destabilize these state systems and also encourage aggressive policies hoping to acquire additional wealth that will ease some of the problems that are in part due to weather. Another destabilizing factor was the Black Death. The Black Death showed up in Europe in the late 1340s. Now, it came from a long way away. Let's go back to world map for a second. We won't go into all the gritty details. You can see the world history course if you want to get into that. But basically, we think uh, what was known as bubonic plague uh, began here in northern Asia and was carried by fleas and carried particularly by camels that were bringing goods out of Asia and, of course, into uh, the eastern Mediterranean and had been for centuries. Again, part of this, how did all of this get started? Part of it has to do with climate change again, but I'm not going to get into the details of it. But essentially, the Black Death began sweeping across Eurasia. It drastically affected the Middle East, certainly affected, uh, I mean, uh, the Indian subcontinent, China, was severely damaged. Uh, it may have led to the destabilization of one of the great dynasties. And it devastated populations here in the Middle East and devastated populations in Europe. And we're talking about instances where 30 to 40 percent of the population is being killed over decades, quarter century, half century, a century, because once the plague was there, and it, as I said, it gets to Europe by the 1340s, it will recur time and time again over the course of a number of centuries. And you think about it, wiping out a third of the population. Again, for state stability, this isn't good. People are unhappy when they're dying like flies. And again, states' systems didn't really see themselves as having great responsibility for public health, although they would come to change their minds about that. But on the other hand, when people are dying all over the place on you, you have to do something or try to do something. Even if we don't talk about protests, you have to talk about debilitating state systems. In other words, the near collapse of some of these political systems, they can't function. You know, they've got relatively small educated population, which they use for administrative purposes, and yet these people are dying left and right. The worst mortality rates were in urban areas, and of course that's where state systems tend to concentrate their administrative structures, so they're really getting hit. Uh, for example, the Byzantine Empire, Byzantium. Yeah, we'll just briefly mention this. This part of the world is part of the old Roman Empire. It essentially collapsed and was conquered by the Ottomans. We'll mention that in a minute. One of the reasons why that occurred is because the Byzantines, their system of government was being undermined by the Black Death. There were so many people dying, it became difficult if not impossible to administer what was left of the empire. So the spread of the Black Death adds to the turmoil. Things are being shaken up. Power structures are changing. And in fact, what we're getting in much of the Mediterranean at this time is a power vacuum. Many of the old states, like Byzantium or the Byzantine Empire, are passing from the scene. And they're being replaced by, in many cases, chaos and anarchy. So you got a power vacuum. Someone's going to move in to fill it. And who might that be? Well. The contenders. On the one side, we have the Habsburgs. They're the Spanish. I'll explain a little bit more about them in a moment. And on the other side, the Ottomans. These are the two dynastic systems that are going to contend for power and control. We see their motivations, and then we see the opportunity, if you will, that's being created because so much turmoil is being 
spread around the Mediterranean world by climate changes, by the Black Death, etc. Now to look at the Habsburgs and where they came from first, looking at Spain. Most people know a little bit about Spain and Portugal. Uh, Spain was created, if you will, by small Christian principalities in northern Spain. Here we can look at the map again for a second. In both Spain and Portugal, because we're going to tell the same story about Portugal, uh, Islamic forces had swept up through Spain by the 8th, 9th centuries, and only gradually over the centuries were Christian kingdoms or principalities in the north able to drive the Islamic groups out of Spain, out of Portugal, and back to North Africa. So eventually, Spain emerges out of this process known as the reconquest, reconquering the Spanish uh, domain. This process, at least in Spain, uh, essentially is capped by the merger of the two principalities that were behind this process at this time, Castile and Aragon. Castile was the larger and more important of the two. And specifically, the wedding of the two people that represented these two systems, Isabella and Ferdinand. You know, you, know, you hear about them in American history because they're the ones that, you know, sent Columbus off to discover the new world. Now, the whole idea of taking these two people, the heirs to their respective thrones, Castile and Aragon, uh, having them marry and then merge and create what was more or less a single state, uh, came out of the concept of dynastic monarchy. And what that meant was this, that in Europe there had developed the idea that kings and queens essentially inherited the right to rule. That the right to rule was essentially family property. So that your heirs would inherit this right to rule, this kingdom. So what you could do, theoretically, is merge state systems by marrying two people together. I mean, family was the way that wealth was passed down from one generation to another. And that's how you did it. It was through your legitimate offspring. This concept of dynastic monarchy says, well, a part of that property baggage, at least for kings and queens, is the right to rule itself. So if you inherited Isabella, the right to rule Castile, and you know, Ferdinand, you got Aragon, okay, when you two marry, you bring those rights together, we get one kingdom. Now, of course, what this led to were a lot of unhappy marriages. <laughs> Dr. Phil would have been excited because, you know, the first thought is, you know, you're not marrying so-and-so because you love him or he loves you. It's because we each happen to hold particular positions, which means merging these two together will create an expanded and em more empowered state. So people often didn't even see each other until they were actually, you know, getting ready to get married. Uh, and of course, you could have like a 12-year-old girl marrying a 50-year-old guy. You know, <laughs> hey, <laughs> it's fate. Uh, we were meant to be together. Or at least our kingdoms were. Uh, so this was the idea of combining uh, dynastic systems together. That this dynastic concept of monarchy said you could do this kind of thing and merge into a single state. So that's how we got Spain by putting Castile and Aragon together, by putting Ferdinand and Isabella together. Now, there is another power in Europe at this time that is significant, and that is what is called the Holy Roman Empire. Let me quickly go back to the map here. It's essentially what would constitute modern Germany, Austria, this part of Central Europe. Okay, that's the Holy Roman Empire, and it's ruled by a family known as the Habsburgs. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could marry somebody from Spain with somebody from the Habsburgs and put them together, that would merge, wow, lots of this and lots of that into a single state. And here's how it happened. Okay. Ferdinand and Isabella have a daughter named Juana, who's also known as Juana the Mad, because uh, she was crazy. Yeah, she obviously had serious mental problems. Maybe because her parents made her marry Philip of Habsburg. Uh, we're not sure. In any case, 
neither of these people were terribly well. Uh, Warner was mentally unbalanced, and Philip wasn't too physically strong. But they did manage to have a male heir, to generate a male heir. And therefore, that male heir becomes the ruler of not only the Holy Roman Empire, but he's also king of Spain. And he's got a lot of territory. In fact, his possessions, take another moment, back to a different map. Once Charles comes along, the son of Warner and Philip, he's got Spain. He's got the Holy Roman Empire. He's got what's called the Netherlands. Okay? He's got areas, you see Italy's kind of broken up into all kinds of pieces, but he's got pieces of Italy as well. I mean, he's all over the place. He has a multinational empire that's been created by these intermarriages. You start with Ferdinand and Isabella, okay? Now they produce Juana, Juana marries Philip of Habsburgs, and they produce Charles, and Charles V becomes king of just about everything. So, literally, this guy has a multinational empire to rule. Spain, the Holy Roman Empire, parts of Italy, the Netherlands, etc. And... In the process, two areas become of primary concern to him and his successors. One is the Mediterranean. They've got interests in the Mediterranean. They control parts of Italy. And Charles is thinking like other monarchs of the time. How do you get wealth? I mean, you've got this huge empire that's all over the place. How are you going to generate the revenues to govern this thing effectively? Well, one way to do it is generate wealth through control of commerce. And of course, you're sitting right at the edge on the waters of one of the most important commercial centers in the world at this time, the Mediterranean. So logically, Charles looks to the east. He wants to control as much of the Mediterranean's commercial wealth as possible. Now, at the same time, for him, something else is happening. You remember. His grandparents, Ferdinand and Isabella, they had sent this guy Columbus off to the west. He finds a new world, well, and we'll see what he finds later, but he finds a valuable empire, a region full of metallic wealth, silver and gold. So Charles is going to be going in two directions, and right now we're going to focus on what he was looking at in the east, because, of course, he wants to control the commerce of the Mediterranean, but he's not alone in that desire because there are folks at the other end of the Mediterranean who want to do the same thing, called the Ottomans. Now, the, the Ottoman Empire is, again, like these European states that we've talked about, a warrior state. The Ottomans are Turkish-speaking people who migrated into the region. They were really assisting other Turks uh, we mentioned, I think, the Mamluk Empire in Egypt. They came in with the Mamluks. They established themselves in what is modern-day Turkey and eventually begin to create their own empire. In fact, their power is such that by 1354, they're able to invade the Balkans. Again, back to map. Okay. Here's the Ottomans here. And by 1354, what was the Byzantine Empire over here they're able to invade and eventually encompass this whole area of the Balkans and also uh, what is modern-day Greece, what was Yugoslavia, of course you've heard about Serbia, etc. All of that falls to them in the years after 1354. Right? So they're actually able to expend, extend their empire beyond what is modern-day Turkey all the way into the Balkans. And of course many of the problems involving the Balkans that we've been dealing with in recent years stem all the way back to this period to the time of the Ottoman invasion, and to the time when the population divided between those uh, who ascribe to Islam and those who remain Christians, and those kinds of problems remain in the region right to today. But it was clear that the Ottomans were doing a good job of military expansion and were very effective at it. However, their empire was pretty loosely structured. It was not a highly advanced centralized system at this time. And they discovered to their sorrow that they really weren't prepared to deal with serious threats that would challenge their military strength. Specifically, 
another nomadic invader from Central Asia, a fellow named Timurlane, invaded and sacked Ankara, their capital. Now, Timurlane, we won't go into detail because he's tangential to what we're talking about, but he was probably one of the most unpleasant people uh, in history. He liked killing people, uh, sacked major cities. When he went into Ankara, he went in and left you know, pyramids of human skulls in his wake because his way of dealing with administration was, well, you massacre everybody in sight, and boy, that's the last time anybody's going to give you a problem. <laughs> you know, no one's going to be challenging you if you kill everybody in sight. Um, he tended to engage in that kind of behavior. But in any case, uh, his attack uh, and capture of the capital city was a lesson to the Ottomans. And in the decades after that, they would restructure this system, what was sort of a basic, you know, grab and rob warrior state, much like many of the European states, would now become far more sophisticated, would become a powerful centralized empire. And that happens first under the Sultan Murad II. He is the one that begins what is a long process of making this something more than this group of warriors who go out and invade and capture territory and take treasure away from people. One of the things that the Ottomans did that will help create this powerful system for them is create what was known as the Janissary Corps. Now, what this was were young children, males, who were taken as slaves from Christian families. Now, of course, you say slave, and you're like, oh, God. But they were slaves only in a technical sense. They, the reason that they were declared slaves was so that the sultan would have absolute control over them. In other words, as adults, if these people should go against the sultan, if they tried to overthrow him, etc., the sultan would not have to submit them to Islamic justice, which could be long and elaborate, court systems, etc. He could simply have them executed because they were technically slaves. But in fact, they were brought into the Ottoman Empire, they were raised by Islamic families, they were trained, educated, and they were the people who would become military leaders and to some degree also bureaucrats. As we'll see, the Barbarossas were the sons of the members of a member of the Janissary Corps. Their father was part of the Janissary Corps. What's the importance of this? The importance is that what the Ottomans are doing are, is creating an early modern version of a professionalized military. Now, the way the military generally works at this time is that you've got a group of noblemen, call them, you know, whatever title you want, depending upon the culture or civilization you're in, uh, and they, in turn, have peasants uh, who owe obligations to them, and when it comes time to organize a war, you go out and say, okay, go out and get those peasants, drag them in here, and let's get started. We have to form an army and go kill some people. And it works, you know, I mean, at that time it worked pretty well. Uh, but it's not very efficient. You know, these are not fully trained, prepared warriors. Most of them have been, you know, sort of dragooned into this at the last minute. And then when the war is over, everybody goes home and goes back to whatever they were normally doing. Here you're getting a group of people who are being trained as professional soldiers. And you know, not only officers, but men as well. The other nice thing is because they're not part of the Sultan's family they are less likely to get involved in dynastic politics. Hmm? But the most important thing is you get essentially a bureaucracy that's actually being trained in a centralized form. This is really important in establishing a stable administrative system in an imperial order. Now another thing that the Ottomans do that works very well is get a steady source of income from something called timars. And what Timars were, were taxing districts. As the Ottomans you know, invaded the Balkans, raced across northern Africa, etc., as they made these territorial conquests, they would divide up the conquered regions into these taxing districts. And then either an Ottoman military officer who had been part of the conquest or local officials would take on the Timar or would be responsible for collecting the tribute or the tax. This has two solid purposes to it. One, it rewards 
the military who are going out and conquering these areas because they get to collect the tax and of course you always get to keep a part. Yeah, you're collecting it for the sultan but meanwhile you always take a portion for yourself. So that gives reward to the military. At the same time, local elites, in other words, let's say you're oh, um, uh, a local ruler in the Balkans, you know, and the Ottomans show up one day and, boy, and they run right over your village. Yeah, so much for the old Byzantine Empire, they're gone. But when the Ottomans come, instead of chopping off your head, they say, look, at, as the head of this village, we're going to turn this into a timar, you're going to be collecting taxes for us, and guess what, you get to keep part. Great. <laughs> Where do I sign up to be an Ottoman? So this incorporated the local elites that got conquered into the empire. They had a vested interest in supporting the Ottomans because they helped collect the taxes. Now another thing that the Ottomans did that was again very helpful to them and to their empire uh, was their view of Islam and their view of peoples of other religious backgrounds. Specifically, they referred to Jews and Christians as people of the book. The Bible is a part of Islamic tradition. Okay? Muhammad is seen as a new prophet, one after Christ. Okay? Christ is seen as a prophet, Muhammad as a prophet who comes after him. So Jews and Christians are part of the Islamic religious tradition. And therefore, they, while they are to be a subordinate part of an Islamic society, they are not to be forced to convert to Islam. This is very different, by the way. Uh, Christian monarchs had a very different view of this whole process. Uh, with Christian monarchs, the basic idea was that your legitimacy was based on a divine grant of legitimacy. In other words, God is the one who says, you can be the monarch, your family can be this dynasty. And therefore, religious affiliation was seen as the most critical part of loyalty to the monarch. So when a Christian king conquers a region, what he wants to see is that everybody is a Christian, right? <laughs> and if they're not, they better get to be fast. And over the centuries, for example, in Spain, various policies were followed, uh, expelling uh, Muslims, expelling Jews, or forcing them uh, to convert to Christianity because it was seen as essential. You, you know, since God gave you this power to rule, you must be certain in turn that the people under you, your residents, if you will, your subjects, are loyal to Christianity, to that Christian God. With Islam, there was a more open view, and the Ottomans in particular practiced this by saying, okay, yeah, Christians and Jews are not going to be subject to forced conversion, and instead they set up a system, what was known as the Millet system, and the Millet system allowed for the religious leaders of these communities to essentially govern their internal affairs. They would settle internal issues within, you know, the Christian community, let's say, in Cairo or wherever the Ottomans happened to conquer, uh, and become the principal negotiator, if you will, between the Ottomans and the local community. You know, when word goes out, well, look, everybody has to participate in you know, the payment of a tax, or we have new rules about um, how the city is going to be governed, that information is communicated through the local religious leader. So religious communities of Christians and Jews could flourish within the Ottoman Empire. Again, given the diversity of the populations they were conquering, this was a very positive factor. Rather than having you know, forced conversions, and this happened to Spain, uh, forcing people to convert and people who spent decades, sometimes centuries, uh, covertly practicing their own religion and, of course, deeply resenting uh, the Spanish monarchy for forcing them uh, to convert in terms of their religion. Uh, the Ottomans had a much more open kind of system that made for far greater tranquility within the empire. Now, another aspect of the Ottoman Empire is its sheer power. Now, the figures I put down here, around the time that we're going to be talking about, in the early 1500s, when we get to the Barbarossas, roughly the Kingdom of Castile, which was one of the largest segments of 
Charles's empire and really the main source of military power. They, Charles could have generated about 15,000 troops to go to war. If he's got a major war on his hands, if he has to go, for example, suppress an uprising somewhere in the Netherlands or uh, attack the Ottoman Empire somewhere, he can put together an army of about 15,000 troops. That's about it. That's his maximum. The Ottoman Sultan at that time could put together 50,000 troops. <laughs> so they got a three to one advantage. So one of the things to think about as we look at this contention for power is that at least as a land-based force, the Ottomans were far more powerful. I mean, they just sheer, sheerly outnumbered you. Now, one of the other things that worked to their advantage was their use of firepower and specifically cannon. And the Ottomans built massive siege cannons, things that would be enormous in length and weight and were used for the purpose of surrounding a city and then firing into the city to break down its walls so that the invaders could eventually uh, overrun the city. The Spanish and other Europeans tended to favor smaller artillery that was more mobile, that they could use in actual armed conflicts. Now, why is this important? It's important because later on it has a significant role to play that on the one hand there's a certain advantage of having these huge cannon that you actually have to dismantle to move around anywhere because it's great when you're attacking cities. But on the other hand, on a smaller scale, you can use the smaller artillery and move it around more. And then it comes to a question of naval warfare. The Ottomans have an incredible land-based military force. There's no question about it, just in sheer numbers alone. They have these professional soldiers, the Janissary Corps. But they're not much when it comes to naval warfare. If the Spanish, Charles V, his successes, the Habsburgs, were going to have a shot, their advantage would come in naval warfare because the Ottomans aren't even on first base ship okay, in terms of the development of a naval force. You might say, well, wait a minute, how could they possibly hope to control you know, commerce in this region if their naval forces were slow in developing? Well, the simple answer is this, going back to the map one more time, where they sat in the world, this was essentially a nexus of trade routes, okay? The trade coming through here and here into Asia. So simply by where they sh sat in terms of their land-based territories, they were in a position to control trade. But of course, if they wanted to have control over the large Mediterranean and its trade, they were going to need a navy and a well-developed navy. Okay, so what has that got to do with cannon and artillery? Well, you're not going to take a siege cannon and put it on a ship, okay? Because if you do, and like you put it in the bow, the ship would go and sink. Simple. It'd be too big. On the other hand, if you're used to building small artillery, as the Europeans did, it'd be much easier to adapt those things to use on a ship at this time, because they're smaller pieces. That will be another advantage, at least, that the Europeans will have for a time. And the significance of all of this, this is where the Barbarossas are going to come in. Now, you've got the Spanish on the one side with their advantage in terms of naval warfare. You've got the Ottomans with their huge land-based army, but wanting to control the Mediterranean, but not really having, I mean, they've got a navy, but it's really not very effective. Who better to create a navy for you, at least in an informal way originally, and then later in a formal sense. But pirates, I mean, they're good at this stuff. Yeah, they know how to use small artillery. They know how to mm -hmm. engage in naval warfare. That's their business. So the Barbarossas fit this very important niche. Why are pirates so important to the Ottomans? Because they will help fill in this gap. You know, they've got this overwhelming advantage in numbers and professionally trained soldiers, but they have the disadvantage that they're not very good at naval warfare. The Barbarossas will find their calling, particularly the younger brother, in providing a navy, right, an informal naval force, and then an actual formal navy for the Ottoman Empire. Okay. As far as how the conflict is going to begin, we talked about 
Genoa and Venice, these two city-states in Italy, and how important they were in terms of trade. They had been doing, handling much of the European side of the trade with Asia and the trade along the Mediterranean. Now, each of them, as imperial systems developed, began making alliances or connections. Genoa connects itself with the Ottomans, okay, with Constantinople. So the Genoa is on the side of the Ottomans. Venice, on the other hand, is siding with the Mamluks. The Mamluks, remember, are this other imperial system in Egypt. So each city-state has made a deal with one of these empires. And why would they do that? Well, again, look at the map. Here's the Ottomans. Here's the Mamluks down here. Genoa, Venice. All the trades coming in over here. You know, if you want spices, silks, etc., from Asia, you got to get them here. They're going to come through here because these guys are sitting right on the trade routes. So if you want to continue your trade, you better find a way to get along with one of these two. So they each choose, you know, Genoa does the Ottomans, Venice does the Mamluks, they each choose an ally. However, Venice is going to turn out to have made the wrong choice in this sense. The Ottomans decide they would like to control the Mamluk Empire. So in 1517, they invade it and overrun it. And from there, they then begin spreading across North Africa. Now, the Ottomans have really established their position in the Eastern Mediterranean. They are the dominant land-based force in the Eastern Mediterranean. And if anybody wants to trade with the East, and that's where the really valuable trade is coming in and has been for centuries, and if they want to do spices, if they want to do silks, diamonds, etc., you're going to have to deal with the Ottomans. The Mamluks aren't even there anymore as an alternative. Uh, for a while, Venice will try to defeat the Ottomans, you know, attack them uh, using its own navy. Because, of course, they have no other option. They've been cut off because the Mamluk Empire has been overrun. But ultimately, Venice will essentially destroy itself trying to defeat the Ottomans. So the Ottomans are the only show in the eastern Mediterranean. And now they're moving west because they're coming across North Africa. Of course, where's Spain? Spain's out there at the other end of the western Mediterranean. They want to see continued trade in the Mediterranean, which they want to control, which they want to influence. The clash is inevitable. And again, here's where the Barbarossas will show up. Now, that's one area of conflict between these emerging trading empires where pirates will show up and we know what the role of Barbarossas is essentially going to be. Example number two, the Portuguese. The Portuguese story is much like the Spanish. It starts as a small Christian principality driving Islamic forces out. They actually did it before the Spanish did it. The dynastic family is known as the House of Aviz. In this case, the sort of turning point where we get to the rise of modern Portugal is with the capture of Lisbon in 1147. In other words, the Avis are coming down from northern Portugal, driving south with the capture of Lisbon, which will be their capital. This is the major turning point for them. And they become a centralized warrior state, in fact, even before Spain does. They, too, are looking to advance themselves as a trading center. And they have particular reason to do so because their agrarian system is not that strong. There's not a lot of fertile land. On the other hand, they have a fair amount of experience in terms of coastal sailing and fishing. So they're going to look for a trading empire. They start in 1415 by invading and capturing Ceuta, which is here on the North African coast and is a major trading center at this time. Now, after they do that, what the Portuguese will proceed to do from that point on is to engage in a series of exploratory ventures around the coast of Africa and on into Asia, establishing trading outposts all along that African coast and on into Asia itself. These dates just give you an idea of how they advanced down the African coast. The bulge of Africa, the great outer bulge of Africa that uh, stretches into the eastern Atlantic. They reached that by 1469. This Portuguese uh, explorer, Diego Cao, he gets to 
the Congo River by 1481 and encounters what was known as the Kingdom of the Congo and establishes relations with the ruler of the Kingdom of the Congo. Now, I'll come back to that slide if you haven't finished with it, but just to show you what we're talking about. Here are the Portuguese coming down along the coast. Here's the Bulge of Africa. Here's the Congo River. They've gotten here by 1481. They will continue on down, establishing trading posts in East Africa, and then on into the Pacific, and we'll get to that in a moment. Now, in terms of their connections with Africa, one of the keys to their relationships with Africa at this time was the slave trade. Already in 1481, the Portuguese are looking for slaves. Why? Because they've established sugar plantations on small islands off the African coast. This kind of trade has been going on ever since ancient times with sugar plantations in the Mediterranean, etc. And the Portuguese begin what becomes a massive trade in human beings with the slave trade in Africa beginning at this time. And eventually, of course, millions of these people will be taken across to work on the plantations in the Western Hemisphere, both in the southern United States and in Latin America. But this is the beginning of this great trading empire. Now, the Portuguese are going to reach beyond Africa. They're going to reach out into Asia. Remember I talked about the Ottomans controlling spices and all that because of where they're located? Well, where are the spices coming from? Again, I'll come back to this slide in a moment. Here on this map, out here in what's modern-day Indonesia, here are the spice islands in these eastern parts of what's modern-day Indonesia. Here's where the spices are coming from. And it is here, as the Portuguese come down and establish themselves in a series of outposts, for example, Goa in India. And again, you'll see this on the other slide, so you'll know the proper spelling. Portuguese come down, establish a series of outposts, including outposts in the Spice Islands. And this is how they will seek to tap that invaluable trade that has been going on for centuries and coming into the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, what the, Spani and what the Portuguese do is establish trade links from the Spice Islands to Guharat, which is in northwestern India, and then to the Eastern Mediterranean. This is where the spice trade has functioned for centuries upon centuries. People have been shipping spices from the islands to India and then on across the Middle East into the Mediterranean. The Portuguese under Alfonso de Albuquerque, who was a nobleman, military officer, naval officer, begin their own intervention into the spice trade. The Albuquerque's strategy is to establish a series of choke points, Goa in 1510, Malacca in 1511, Hormuz in 1515. And what do we mean by these choke points? And again, I'll come back to the slide so you can see it. Here on the map, here's Malacca right here. Okay? Spices in this trade have to go through the Straits of Malacca. So if you control Malacca, which the Portuguese will do, you can control the trade. Here in Northwest Africa, and in Northwest India, this is where the trade has been centered. You go from here and then trade in India, and it's shipped on from there. Well, if you get an outpost in Western India, you can control the trade there. So a series of chunk, choke points, and the last one is Hormuz uh, in the Middle East. And let me see if I got a map that will show you that. I had one. Yeah, okay, well, yeah, you've got choke point here, you've got one here, and then here. Here's the Strait of Hormuz. So here, here, and here. These are the places where you establish military outposts and control the trade. Portuguese are going to establish a monopoly in the spice trade in the time after the establishment of these choke points, these military outposts. They want a monopoly of all of the spices coming out of this region into Europe. They're also going to try to control trade in general in this region by setting up a licensing system on the coast of India, through the Spice Islands, where whatever you're trading, you need a license from the Portuguese. If you don't have a license, they seize your goods. Now, 
as we will see, the question becomes, isn't this piracy? I mean, these people have no right to do this. Is this legal? What's legal? What's the legal precedent? Needless to say, the Ottomans are going to have their own response. They're not going to be too happy. They're going to attack the Portuguese for doing this. So we're going to engage in another conflict over the spice trade. But here, the critical issue is not so much the Ottoman response as the response of other people who have been trading for centuries in the spice trade when suddenly the Portuguese come in and want to control it completely by establishing these choke points. And two, they establish an attempted monopoly on all kinds of trade in the whole region in the Western Pacific, the Indian Ocean, etc. Next time, second half, we'll come back and look further at these developments in other regions of the world and the rise of these great trading empires. And we'll do that in just a few minutes after we take a break. Hmm.